Hi everyone, I'm Bobby Dooley, an account executive from Elucidata. Welcome to track two of Data Fair. Our session will focus on fair transformation. The fair transformation track will explore how leaders have successfully adopted fair data practices within their organizations to support AI and ML initiatives. As a reminder, track one is occurring simultaneously. So please feel free to switch back and forth between the sessions. All the sessions are also being recorded, so no need to take copious notes and will be made available after the meeting ends. Additionally, we'd like to encourage all of our attendees to participate in the session by utilizing the chat and raise hand features. If you have a question for our speakers, please add it to the Q&A chat window. You can access it by clicking the blue chat icon on the right side of your auditorium screen. We will try to answer as many questions as we can directly in the Q&A chat window or live during the Q&A session at the end of each presentation. So for our first talk, we have Giovanni Nassato. He is a Pistoia Alliance associate where he currently manages the FAIR implementation project. Giovanni works as a consultant for biopharmaceutical organizations, innovation networks, and digital health startups. He has 25 years experience in collaborative innovations in international settings across diverse industries. Today, he'll be diving deep into the state of fairness in the clinical space across metadata concepts and standards, clinical trial registries, clinical data quality, and governance. Giovanni, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for the very kind introduction. Uh, let me see if I can share my screen. Excellent. And I'm going to try to put a laser pointer to so you can maybe see what I'm looking at. So today, um, I'd like to introduce briefly the Pistoia Alliance for those of you that don't know what it is. And uh, I'd like to send a few words on the FAIR implementation project and uh, reminding uh, you what uh, the, the team has been building the past few years. And then I'll, I'll go pretty quickly actually on the upcoming FAIR for Clean guide, which is really about FAIR implementation in the clinical space. So first of all, the Pistoia Alliance, uh, it's a, a non-for-profit uh, members-led association established about 10 years ago. And it's really about enabling pre-competitive uh, collaboration in the pharma space. So we're delivering uh, workshop webinars, uh, also communities of practice, uh, best practices and things that can help uh, towards the creation of, uh, of some shared resources that could in some cases become standards. Uh, today I'll be speaking to you about fair implementation. It's one of the projects we have, but there are many other initiatives, uh, including um, STEM, Women in Science, and AI. And I uh, encourage you to look at the Pistoia Alliance website for, for more details. So FAIR, I probably don't need to introduce it to, to, to this group, uh, but it stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. It's uh, a set of principles. So in that sense, it's more aspirational and more of a guidance, uh, more of directionality, and it's not a standard by itself. And another point that um, is extremely important is the, if their principles in, uh, should enable the machines to better understand what humans are asking of them. And this should uh, be able to help machines understand one another and thereby increasing the level of automation in different processes. There's many different ways to, to implement this, but just uh, uh, this is a, a picture that will also be in the, in the Fair for Clean guide. The, one of the points is that um, FAIR principle in their implementation, especially using uh, contemporary um, uh, web technologies, semantic web technologies, uh, really are an enabler of a digital transformation. And that irrespective of the uh, function in pharma companies, it happens that a lot of adoption has occurred in uh, relatively early stages, data analytics, R&D, but there's no particular reason why uh, many other functions in pharma could benefit from it. And uh, um, just maybe at very high level, there are some translation of those principles. For example, findable, uh, it usually means that uh, an organization has to uh, want to and start implementing global, unique, resolvable identifiers, for example, or having policies for putting those in place. Accessibility means really having a resolution protocol standard supporting authentication, authorization, understanding, 
how you can access data, metadata, and, uh, and trace it. Interoperability, uh, again, often this is implemented, implemented sorry, using semantic web technology. So you want to have vocabularies at the very least, uh, ontologies, knowledge graphs. You want to have ways for machines to somehow begin to make sense of, of, uh, of uh, what are we calling the data, what are we calling the metadata, and how all of these things are connected and interconnected. And that enables the reusability, uh, having rich metadata, including identity of uh, ownership, licensing, and other uh, provenance uh, characteristics, enables to automate different processes for greater efficiencies and uh, enabling different transformations. The um, the project just a few a few words been going for several years, so I had the pleasure to to take over it from from Thomas Liener, who himself took it over from Ian Harrow, uh, and uh, I've been active in it since uh, June of this year. There's been a lot of collaborations that were, were set up, including with um, IMI driven projects such as uh, Fair Plus. Uh, a webinar series has been set up, and uh, actually uh, we had a webinar just yesterday and another interesting upcoming one in a few weeks. And today I'll be telling you a bit more very rapidly about the toolkit and then introduce some aspects about uh, the Fair for Clean guide. So the toolkit is, uh, is actually a website and really the, the concept is to uh, introduce a broad community to first of all, why does fair data matters in the first place? Um, starting introducing some, some use cases, um, elements of training that can be used, including for change. And a lot of aspects of fair implementation are actually about um, organizational culture change. It's not just uh, um, IT tools. And uh, also tools, for example, having an understanding of some data management plans or maturity indicators. So the um, one of the points of the many points, and then one thing that we will, are still going to work on are, for example, uh, examples of cost benefits and uh, uh, motivation for let's say return of on the investment to actually change an infrastructure and make it more fair. Uh, so this is what the uh, website uh, looks like, and um, you you really find it uh, organized in in uh, tools, maturity indicators for the the different principles, uh, but also some training elements and some. Uh, uh, some points that can be used for uh, to manage and to promote uh, change within organizations. So a lot of this is essentially guidelines and and and, uh, and text. And uh, um, again, happy to say that a lot of this is connected with the Fair Plus Cookbook, which is again a, a huge um, body of work that was uh, created recently. And uh, we are interlinking these two resources uh, as we move on. Um, just to give you an example, without going into much detail, but uh, of the use cases you can find on on the toolkit, um, actually Elucidata contributed to one of those in um, uh, using, let's say, fair compliant um, processes for annotation and evaluation of RNA sequencing. Uh, but there's also uh, examples from from the clinical uh, world uh, how um, a verification process can occur and add value on a clinical trial data from, uh, as an example, from Roche. But you will find uh, uh, another number of, of use cases, and that's a very important part of the, of the toolkit. Now, when we talk about FAIR and the clinical space, um, I don't know exactly where all of you are in terms of uh, um, the functions in, in, in different companies, but um, for historic reasons, FAIR principles are more associated with academic work and then uh, more in, um, let's say, a heavy data computational and analytics department. And more often than not, this tend to be in, uh, in research rather than uh, the clinical space. And these are just some um, analogies are always very dangerous, but uh, these are just some, some reflections or some conversations and some um, examples that um, been confronted with, but uh, uh, one can look at implementing fair principles uh, and uh, it's really transformations in, in pharma and pretty much everything you touch in pharma is critical and it's as if you were uh, changing a vehicle in motion or even more, more interestingly and excitingly, a vehicle in flight. Now, when you're in research, 
your vehicle might be relatively uh, light and uh, there may be multiplicity of them and you might be able to enjoy a certain amount of flexibility. Uh, you still have long-term visibility. You know, these vehicles can climb pretty high and you're interested in long-term outcomes. And one of the key words is exploratory and there's a lot of diversity. So in, in some sense, that is actually one of the motivation why, uh, for example, uh, findability and also the reusability can be appealing in some research functions. Now, when you're going into, into clinical data, um, all of a sudden, it's a, it's another kind of vehicle. It's a, um, quite heavier. It's a, it's also it has different moving parts that have to function together. Uh, it carries a lot more people uh, with you as well. And some of the outcomes, uh, think of advanced stage clinical trials, they are pretty constrained, uh, and uh, there's a lot of scrutiny. And uh, so it, maybe the key word instead of exploratory here is regulatory, and you have to and you have to to manage all of uh, all of that. So it's not a it's not a trivial thing. Uh, nevertheless, just uh, trying to make the case for, for why fear uh, might make sense or does make sense in clinical uh, data space. If you look at um, just a simplified, um, very simplified view, but in um, if I look at a space in which I have clinical trial data, uh, I need to comply to certain uh, standards, certain communication and, and reporting standards. And the, the mandatory scope of, uh, of the data is actually to show the, the, primary, the primary uses that I need to show that my drug is, is safe and uh, it, it has certain efficacy. And um, now this is a relatively, is a, that's a relative um, value of data scale. Uh, this doesn't mean that the data has no value. Of course, it's it's very valuable if you can show that your that your compounds are are, are safe and their their efficacy. But this is maybe relative to what we could do with it if we had um, other ways to um, to manage it and to extract and maybe more value and reuse it. Now it's also clear that, and that's actually one exercise that was done by the team that fairness, so to speak, let's say the um, complying with or following uh, fair principles is not something that's mandatory in, in any way, shape or form in clinical trials. And uh, just one way to, to, to look at it is, um, and by the way, this is a relatively um, generous uh, estimate of the, um, the, the way in which clinical registries today I wouldn't say would comply with FAIR because FAIR, again, is not a standard, but somehow align with the principles. So if you look at, for example, the criteria of findability or accessibility, uh, whether you look at clinicaltrials.gov or if you look at, the, look at the, the, the clinical trial platforms in Europe, you will find different, different issues. The, it's clear that it, the, the accessible, somehow one of the accessible uh, elements, and that's kind of the, the tip of the iceberg, themselves are not, are not fair at this point, uh, but by a long shot. And again, this is a pretty generous evaluation, but, uh, and this was done just taking some real case, um, real cases, just looking, for example, for a clinical uh, trial study uh, data with results for, for diabetes type two or for um, breast cancer. Uh, nevertheless, you know, even if we don't have to do it, there are, some uh, advantages. So what if, for example, uh, we could make sense of in a, in a data-centric uh, system where we, we can now access uh, through automated systems and, and queries, we can actually access very complex uh, data sets across clinical trials. Um, it's perhaps easier to identify uh, meaningful biomarkers, for example, or insights. Uh, what if we could speed up electronic submissions by automating some of the, of the processes? And how about integrating the real world evidence, which again, it's not standardized by itself and uh, could add a lot of value. And what if we could actually enable the secondary use of clinical data? That means uh, reusing or reutilizing insights from a given study in, in another one. And th there's no, there's no real, um, let's say, easy way to do this 
just by complying with the, and again, when I say just by complying, it's it's already quite a job to, to comply with the, the clinical standard regulatory mandatory requirements for data. But if you have a clinical infra data infrastructure, which is uh, fair, you can actually still do what you have to do, but on top of it, uh, enable um, additional, or in some cases, faster um, inside discovery and uh, reporting, and uh, hopefully uh, also um, think of repurposing drugs, for example, you need to dig quite deep and understand uh, which data sets could and which elements of data set can be useful for this. And you can really make use of uh, state-of-the-art or contemporary uh, technologies such as machine learning and, and knowledge, uh, knowledge graphs. So you can actually use the intelligence, so to speak, of machines in your favor. So that's the vision. And um, in the, the first version of the Fair for Clean Guide, now I have to start wrapping up, but I'll, I'll try to show you at least the, the, the first shot of what it would look like. The, the idea is really to, uh, to introduce, and I've been trying to do this in a, in a few minutes, the, the why does it make sense even to contemplate FAIR in the, in the clinical space? And I can say that some companies already are, are taking very active steps in that direction. Um, looking at the clinical study process to, to the FAIR lens, so there's actually quite a lot of, of material, uh, just also looking at different data models and and um, and now the the um, the overlap with the um, with the implementation of of uh, of fair principles and what's to gain there, and uh, and finally actually looking at different uh, clinical trial registries, looking at either the snapshot of real life today and and uh, um, how fair somehow are some uh, some clinical uh, trial registries today. But also looking into elements of, uh, of infrastructure and uh, and culture change. The uh, the guide it's going to it's this is what it's looking like if you are a, a Pistoia Alliance uh, member. This will be announced actually next week at, uh, at the annual conference. Uh, so the uh, the first version of the guide will be published as a um, as a as a confluence page that will be publicly available in a, in a couple of weeks. The first the first few weeks is going to be an exclusive for the Pistoia Alliance members. And um, I think I'm reaching or re reached already uh, part of my my time and I'd like to see if there are some questions that I, that I can take. Uh, but if you want to know more and if you want to get involved, so these are a couple of links, first of all, for the FAIR toolkit. Um, the second link is for the, the, the project. It's a, a very high level description of the project and uh, uh, you can also reach me through that. Uh, some of you might be able, uh, I might actually already be registered for the annual um, event in, in Boston. And that's also where I will announce the first steps uh, towards the, the continuation of the fair implementation project moving to, to phase three, where I hope to see some of you actively involved. So just a super short summary. Uh, uh, for those of you that do not know Pistoia, if there are some, just to try to give you a quick uh, reminder or, or uh, creating awareness of its existence. Uh, within the Pistoia Alliance, there is a fair implementation project that's been uh, going on for a while. And uh, the purpose is really to support the, the uptake of fair and implementation of fair principles uh, in the life science industry, especially focusing on pharma. Uh, there are a number of uh, uh, method tools at the moment. They are we are looking also in the options to start uh, sharing or creating more uh, tools tools that can actually be used in the process of your implementation. But at the moment, these are mostly high level methodology tools, and um, and one of the and we're also creating uh, guidance documents or um, the pair for clean guide is some. Uh, I like to think of it as kind of a survival manual. If you if you're looking into starting to implement fair in the clinical space, where would you start? And it's uh, over 50 pages long, as I'm as I'm telling you now. And some some of it is being still edited as I'm speaking uh, right now. A lot of people I want to thank, and starting also uh, especially with uh, Thomas Liner and Ian Hero, my predecessors managing the project, who have been supporting me a lot. And talk about support. This project is financed uh, by um, 
largely the, the first companies on this on this list. And um, I'm also thankful to all the peacetime members that have contributed. I just showed you the, the, the tip of the iceberg of what we're doing. And um, I hope um, if there are a couple of questions, I can I can uh, give you more details. So thank you also for uh, for your attention. Thank you very much, Giovanni. Uh, that was an excellent talk. And uh, we do have several questions that you could uh, hopefully answer at this point. Um, and they're really around FDA and um, ROI stuff. So the first question is, could you give an example of a success story where a company was able to relook and reevaluate data once they made the data fair and that led to an FDA approval? So if you could connect those dots, that's all. So I, um, so the, the, the thing is, I am aware of uh, several examples of uh, at least one company. And um, I am not sure that I'm at liberty to disclose them. And that's very frustrating. Sure. Uh, but I can tell you that uh, this is one of the things that I, I want to push more in phase three. So I'm, I'm very grateful for the question. I'm also quite frustrated because I know that there are examples and I, um, and, um, I think the community would benefit to having more success stories that are that are shared, so this is the first the first bit. Uh, whether this led to something that's FDA approved yet, that I cannot say. And um, I also would like to say that there's a lot of steps before you go to FDA approval, and uh, and at least there are some example I'm aware of where fair implementation has helped the relationship with FDA. And I cannot say more. I mean. I can say more, but I may not say more. So, so well, come next week, right? To your, to your. Uh, well, <laughs> it might take it might take a few more months to be to be to be honest. But this is actually one of the big one of the big challenges, and and some companies have been investing earlier on and more than others, and they're reaping the benefits earlier. But also, they have an interest in in, in bringing more people in the, in the game because it's a. Um, a lot of this process can benefit from shared resources. Let me put it like that. Right. Okay. Are you ready for the second question? Yes. Yes, absolutely. Um, can Can you give an example of a success story where a company was able to relook and reevaluate data once they made the data fair and that led to an FDA approval? So that that's part of the first question. Second part is, in which stage of drug development, early, preclinical, or clinical, is the impact of fair transformation the most for an organization? So those three, these three steps again: early, then preclinical, or actually, you know, clinical trials. So th this is one of the um, the best thing I could say is gut feeling at this stage, and uh, that's unfortunate, but the. One of the things that that, uh, that we are considering is, and, and it's one of the one of the challenges, is essentially to to start um, qualifying and, and maybe quantifying a bit more the, the impact. Because one of the challenges is that again, this is the analogy of the of the flying airplane. It, it might not be perfect, but it's flying. So so before you start moving, you know. Before you start tweaking with the engine while in flight, you want to see, you know, or maybe you build a third engine before you fire it up. Does it make sense? And uh, am I investing in, in the right point? The, the, the thing is the, the, um, the kind of usage and purpose and, you know, what kind of, what kind of implementation, again, fair principles are principles. They're not a standard. They're not a all or nothing. The question is, at what stage does it make sense to engage in a certain level of verification, if you want, for what purpose? So some of, the, some of your data is historical, and um, does it make sense for organization to go ahead and, and place it at metadata, figuring out what it is? I don't know. It depends on the organization and the stage. So it depends a lot on your, on your organization state, on the data governance and other things. The, the the point is if you want to be able to if you want to be able to deploy in some cases it can be machine learning and different kinds of machine learning you need to have 
the ability to find your data, to know what it is, and to connect it. But even for some other levels of um, value creation, one of the, the things, one of the, the, the biggest assets of any of any knowledge organization and pharma certainly is that is the information, including for very strategic decision making at the top. Mm -hmm. So how do you dig through multiple layers of interconnected systems? So this is really a question of, of, of highest level governance. At, at what point does a company decide to, to make a, sh a cultural shift and say, now the data is our asset and we need to figure out how to interrogate the data as opposed to we have other assets, other functions. And sometimes we think, oh, let's clean up the data for that purpose. So this is really, really kind of a kind of a culture shift. And, and again, some people might be in an infra part of the, of the company where it looks like it's easier. You don't you don't see the return immediately because it could be early stages. Uh, right. And in other cases, people say, oh yeah, um, now we are engaged, but if we had had this ability. So it's really a question of identifying the, the, the spots where you can have an impact that makes sense with the resources you have, but also keep in mind if you have a trajectory towards you know, data-centric model and, and data governance, it's kind of part of the journey to, to get there. That makes a lot of sense. Answer. It's a very long answer. I don't, I, don't know if it, I don't know if it corresponds to what was expected, but that's the best I can give right now. Okay, wonderful. The third question we have is, um, it's a very simple one, maybe thinking about it from a low hanging fruit standpoint. Can you give us some examples of the cost benefit realized by adopting FAIR? And I'm, this is a very interesting question around ROI, cost benefit, tying it quantitatively it's to something that an executive can understand. It's all, it's all stuff that I'm ill-equipped to answer today. So it's, a, it's wonderful <laughs> because it, it actually, it, it's actually really good because it shows where, um, where, where the heart, uh, where the heartbeat of the situation is. And, uh, right. and um, what, what I can say is that um, th this is one of these things where so th there are models. Th there are models that are that are in place in some cases. Uh, I think one of the elements again of what, one of the roles of Pistoia is to provide some some pre competitive um, common advantage somehow, and uh, the ability to to uh, to make sense of some of these projects is one of the tools that I think it will make sense to 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 build. So one of the issues is that part of the cost of not having fair is built in the uh, the operational budgets of several organizations. So in that sense, uh, if there are, and again, everybody strives to, to build an efficient system, but if there are inefficiencies that are functioning, they are built in. So you really have to look at somehow, what does it cost when you don't have it when something happens? And again, those are not easy to publicize or, or to look at. So let, let me give you an example that is not from pharma, and then yep. it's an example that you can look up and it's not exactly fair, but you will see where I'm going to. Just you, you can look up at the, the, what happened with the Mars lander situation a few years ago. And, and you take a jet propulsion laboratory, which are pretty serious people. They are literally rocket scientists and astrophysicists and I, some of my friends work there. And then you can look at other contractors that were, that were charged to building a super important exploration mission. So you, you're, you're flying a, a rocket all the way to Mars and then you're dropping a lander on a parachute. And then you have a piece of code that speaks imperial for the acceleration. And you have other piece of code that receives the message as metric. And guess what? You've crashed a unique mission for, for mankind. That's the cost of fear. That's the cost of not knowing what your metadata is. And we're crashing clinical trials <laughs> every time. And we have people that are flying those clinical trials and they are a lot of respect because it's a super, super stressful job to make sure things work right. And a lot of things right. don't work right because of the systems we have and, and they have to be corrected. Yep. So this, this is one of the, um, how do you put a price on that? <laughs> We're gonna work on it, but, but that's one of the motivations that there are some problems that are solved today that actually cease to be a problem altogether. Right. And that, that, is, that, is, that is a, it's, it's again, there are 
mandatory things you have to do to comply with regulatory requirements. And again, the regulatory requirements are there for very good reason. So you have to keep those. But the, the way I would see it is um, there are some elements of transformation that can be done relatively quickly where people see the benefits. So for example, speak of some automation of some processes that have to happen anyway in the filing. When you do this, you don't have to change everything, but you start you start the process. Right, and, right. And that can help your organization see, oh, we have a small project, but it has benefits. So how about we continue or we make a bigger one? So it's a, it's also not an all or nothing. Yep. Well, thank you so much, Giovanni. That's a great answer. It's great insight. And guys, you, you hear it right here, Pistoia Alliance. If you're very interested in this topic, follow up with Giovanni. Uh, what I'd like to do now, and thank you so much uh, for your time.